All right. Good morning, everyone. And welcome. Welcome to this place, to this wonderful place. Um, it is good to see you all. What time do we end here? Does it end at 11 o'clock? All right. 11.15. Positive. Positively. 11, you're right. Thank you. All right. Again, good morning. We have a lot to get through today. Uh, my name is Matthew Gamble. If you have any questions, comments, points of clarification, you can email me at matthew at thehaven.church. Um, would you prefer me? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to be wherever. I just generally teach from down with the people, for the people, by the people. Um, anyway, we're going to go through quite a bit today. I'm going to share with you several things. So I'm going to share with you just a little bit of an overview of my story. Uh, we're going to look at uh, scripture. We're going to look at statistics. And then we're going to look at solutions. And what we're talking about, I think you all know this already, but we're talking about pornography, um, which is makes me super uncomfortable. Like some people think that it's easy to get up and talk about porn, especially when you're sharing your story. And I'm like, it's not easy because this is stuff we don't typically talk about. Um, we don't typically address in church. In culture, uh, as a society, even though our societies are hypersexual in nature, meaning uh, sex sells, or you see things sexually all around you wherever you go, um, even though our cultures are hypersexual, uh, in our church, in our day to day life, we tend to not discuss such topics. But I would go so far as to argue that. Pornography, in my opinion, and I, I really, I mean, I guess I do have some data, and we're going to see some of the data here in just a minute, um, but even though I don't have data to really support this statement, I would submit that, in my opinion, <laughs> pornography is the biggest thing plaguing uh, the church today, um, and it, it's a bit of a crime, if you will. It's a spiritual crime when we don't talk about it or we don't address it. Uh, and then we sit and question, why are people leaving the church in droves? Well, if we're not addressing the relevant issues, or more specifically and more importantly, if we're not seeing the power of God show up in people's life to deliver them from things they're struggling with, uh, then they're more than likely going to be leaving the church. Um, and when you leave the church, and for instance... When you touch, uh, when you taste alcohol, some of you born and raised in the church, I was not, so I started drinking alcohol at a very young age. Uh, but for the people that were born and raised in the church, uh, that then leave the church and then taste alcohol for the first time, what happens is, is they experience something. Um, and my theory is, is that when people leave the church and they taste something outside of the church, especially something that they were told is bad, but then when they taste it, they experience something internally, like they can feel a difference, whereas all their life they may have gone to the church and never felt a thing other than sheer boredom. If they then leave and then taste this thing that they were told was bad, and it makes them feel good, or they at least feel something different, then they say to themselves, well, Alcohol that was told, I was told was bad, I actually feel something. Church, you told me was good, and I don't feel anything. So there's a disconnect there, and I submit to you that we ought to, our churches ought to be experiencing God. Our people that come to church ought to be experiencing God, experiencing something that is supernatural, something that is changing their lives from the inside out. Uh, for those of you who were at the workshop earlier today, um, we were talking about ways in which we can experience God, and one gentleman shared about his specific encounter experiencing God and how God touched his life, and I would just simply say that the church that I'm a part of, the life, the journey that I'm on, I want to be 
Um, I, I desire, but I also believe that God desires to give me and to give you and to give our people in our churches a regular growing experience with him and not something that's just a mere one-off. Um, but with that all said, I'm going to get into to pornography. I'm going to open uh, by sharing with you a little bit of my story, then we're going to scripture, then to statistics, and then solution. And you will be happy to note that everything and more that I'm going to share with you today will be handed to you on a handout as we land the plane here. So you need not uh, take any notes or any of that. Everything will be handed to you on a hard copy um, uh, right at the very end. We would give it to you now, but then you would tune me out and it would hurt my feelings. Uh, So we'll just go with this and then hand that out at the end. With that all said, I would like to uh, ask you to bow your heads with me in prayer, and uh, we'll get, get into it. Father and Son and Holy Spirit, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for the opportunity yet again to be here in Sweden. I thank you for drawing all your people out by name. We're grateful for all the presentations and workshops that are happening on this campus even right now, and we pray your spirit would be with all the presenters and all the participants Um, And God, as we dive into this difficult topic of pornography, we would just ask that your presence would be here. I pray that you would give me clarity of mind because there's a lot to go through in a little bit of time. Uh, So help me to stay focused on the pertinent things. And I just pray that you would help all of us, God, in this room because all of us are impacted in one way or another. We have been, are, are being impacted or will be impacted Uh, by pornography, and so I just pray that you would take this important topic, make it very plain, uh, uh, make it pertinent to our lives, and Jesus, may we experience you as you are lifted up in this place, is my prayer in your name, amen. Um, So I'm going to go ahead and dive into my story. Uh, uh, When I was eight years old, and I'll I'll just try to bullet through this because I tend to spend a heck of a lot of time on my story, and then we don't get to the other stuff. But um, to bullet through my story, and this is super, I'm kind of glad that uh, maybe the lights are brighter on me and darker on you because I can see you, but not so clearly. Anyway, it's just this type of stuff to talk publicly about my struggle with pornography or my addiction towards pornography is, again, as I said earlier, not something that I look forward to doing, aside from if it helps somebody. Uh, because pornography has absolutely decimated my life. Um, At the age of eight, before I knew God, before I had a relationship with God, uh, I was riding uh, my bicycle with a couple homies uh, in Georgia, outside of Atlanta, Georgia, and we were on a construction site with heavy machinery like bulldozer and crane, and we climbed up into one of the heavy machineries, into the, the driver's seat, and there was a stack of magazines. Now, I'm 40 years old. Many of you are in your teens or 20s, uh, so you probably don't even know what a magazine is, uh, but it's a, a, like a piece of paper with many pages and a binding thing. I just, uh, you certainly know what a magazine is, but anyway, uh, nowadays porn is just readily available on the internet and it is free. Um, and all over the place. Then, uh, when I was eight, I just stumbled upon a stack of porn. And here's the deal with porn. For men, and I'll I'll interject some of these things as we go along, but for men, like, uh, um, men are visually stimulated. And so what happens for a man is when we see pornography for the first time, something click something in our brains just kind of goes off and what happens is is we tend to and I venture to guess if I were go to go around the room which I will not do uh, but if I were because I get to fly home on Monday y'all get to live with each other and so I will not put you on the spot uh, but anyway uh, I venture to guess that if we were go to go around the room every guy here You may not know the exact date, but I would venture to guess that most of you would know roughly the time or the place or you remember the scenery of where you were when you first saw porn. 
Why? Because when you saw it, even though you may not have known what it was, like as an eight-year-old, mama and daddy never sat me down and said, son, it's now time we have a talk. This is pornography. It's bad. Stay away from it. No one ever told me that, but when I saw it, I knew a couple things immediately. One, I liked it. I was like, oh, oh, look at this. And number two, I knew inherently in my heart that I couldn't go show this to mom and dad. Uh, and I would ask you as well on a spiritual level to think about that because uh, uh, spiritually speaking, you have to ask yourself, how is it that a person at the age of eight can see something that instantly they love? They're like, this is the best thing. These are better than cartoons. Uh, this is great. So you love it on one, thing, on one hand, and it's the best thing you've ever seen. And then on the other hand, inherently, you also know that this isn't something, it's taboo. I can't go show this to other people. Uh, that to me is a quandary that on a spiritual level, I would submit, would support that there is actually a difference between good and evil, that there is a difference between God and the devil. Uh, uh, but more on that as we go through the weekend. Uh, but anyway, when I saw it, I loved it. I was hooked immediately. Um, some people, I'm going to use another word that I haven't used so much in the past, but I, I am increasingly using it more, and that is the word masturbation. <sighs> so tough to talk about this stuff. But anyway, masturbation. So with pornography, often one, one student at Atlantic Union College in Massachusetts asked me, he said, Matthew, does pornography and masturbation go hand in hand? I thought he was joking. He was dead serious. But they tend to, to go, no pun intended, hand in hand. But anyway, uh, more on that in just a moment as we get into Scripture. Um, so with pornography tends to come masturbation. With masturbation, what happens is, is you are self-gratifying yourself. So as a young kid, uh, when masturbation was occurring to me, you have this, uh, I mean, in reality, you have a, uh, an orgasm or orgasmic experience, and it is the single best feeling uh, that this planet has to offer that you can experience in yourself. So here, here's what happened in my life, and here's what happens in your life. If you happen to be the person, notice I said, if you happen to be the person that is addicted to pornography or you're addicted to, to, to masturbation, what happens is, is that, or if you're addicted to food, or if you're addicted to whatever you're addicted to, this is how that happens in your brain. Uh, you do a behavior. So for me, look at porn, masturbate, have this great high, great experience, followed by a, typically a deep depression or a sadness. But what happens is, is that when I do that activity, it lays down a neural pathway in my brain. A neurological pathway in your brain is likened to that of a tunnel. So when I rode the subway uh, the other day here in Stockholm, I was in a tunnel but then came out of the tunnel uh, and could see beautiful scenery. Uh, when you're in the tunnel, the tunnel is a tube in which the train runs through. The train is also on a track. Every time you engage in a behavior, say your addiction is food, every time you feel bad and you eat and it makes you feel better, even though it may be temporary, you've just laid down a neurological pathway. And the neurological pathway says to you that if you feel bad and you do this, then that, that makes you feel better, even if it's just for a moment. So for instance, as a young kid, school never came easy to me. Uh, I was never great in academics, so I would come home and I would feel bad because of things happening at school, or maybe I got into a fist fight and I felt bad, or maybe somebody made fun of me and I felt bad, and I turned to this behavior, and that behavior at least gave me a moment of feeling good. What that did was uh, is reinstate in my brain this neurological pathway, it just says, Hey, if you feel bad, do this, and it feels better. Um, uh, and what that is, is really at the essence, 
now as a believer in Jesus Christ, at the essence of that behavior is sin. Because instead of living with the pain of rejection or feeling as though I, I'm not complete or, and learning to live with that and deal with that and grow with that as God would have me to do, I end up laying down this neurological pathway and it actually suppresses reality. Does that make sense? Anybody? So you're actually, you think it's going to feel better or make you feel better, but it actually suppresses reality. You're not learning to deal with reality. So as a young kid, I was doing this behavior. As time went on, I, I, even though God was not in the picture in my life, uh, we would go to church on Christmas and Easter, and that was about it. So even though God wasn't around in my life, or I, I wasn't really focused on God, um, I started to believe in my heart that pornography and masturbation was wrong. So at the age of 13, for instance, when my birthday was coming up, I would pray and be like, you know, not God. I, I should say I didn't even pray, sorry. I wouldn't even pray. I wouldn't turn to God. I would just be convicted in my heart. I need to stop this behavior. I'm 13 now. I have a hair, a piece of hair growing out of my armpit. I'm becoming a man. It's time to stop this. And I would stop for like a day or two days or three days or a week. And then I would be right back in the behavior again. I turned 14, same thing. I need to stop. 15, 16, I need to stop. But I could not stop this repetitive behavior. Have you guys ever heard the phrase, and I know some of the nuances that I share are, are you know, in our culture, but have you ever heard of the phrase, one-track mind? All right, I see one person nodding yes. Uh, the one-track mind. Some women especially spouses look at their husbands and say to the husband, man, all you think about is sex, okay? So that's the one-track mind. That's all they think about. Well, in the States, we, we commonly hear that phrase, the one-track, you have one-track mind. All you think about is one thing. Well, when you're an addict or when you have an addiction or a compulsion towards a certain behavior, in this case, we're talking about pornography and masturbation or lust, what happens is, is that you have this neurological pathway in your brain, and I referenced the tunnel earlier, and as it grows, as, you, as this neurological pathway, as you reinforce that behavior, the tunnel in your brain grows. And this is actually a neurological chemical reality that your brain is actually, the physical makeup of your brain is actually altered where you have a propensity that when the stuff hits the fan and you have something going on in your life, you have this one track, something is triggered, you have a one track mind. So for instance, you can come to church or you can come to this workshop or this weekend and be like, I'm gonna make a decision for Jesus. I will never look at pornography again. I feel very spiritual and this is great. I feel close to God. And then you can walk out of here and immediately go turn to porn again. Why does that happen? Were you being disingenuous when you were saying, I will never do that again? I would submit to you that no, you're not being disingenuous. Part of you is being extremely sincere. Part of you really believes in your heart, I will never do this again. And that would, I would actually submit that that is your God nature. That is the spiritual nature that is desiring goodness. But what happens is, is as the book of James says in James chapter one, you and I, we have a tendency as human beings to be double-minded. And what double-minded is, is that on one hand we can be super spiritual, but then on the other hand we can be super, super sinful, fleshy, selfish. On one hand we can be selfless and give of ourselves, serve other people, but then on the other hand, we can become these narcissistic, it's just all about me. On one hand, we can be saying, I'm going to do the right thing. I want to follow God, and you genuinely mean it. But then on the other, other hand, something gets triggered, and your one-track one mind gets tripped, and then you're smack into porn, and you feel powerless. And you're like, why did I do that? Uh, for those of you uh, girlfriends or boyfriends, because women are not completely uh, off the hook, it's just the majority of porn consumers are men. Uh, that all said, pornographers happen to be um, 
uh, designing their pornography because they understand that women are not as dialed into it, so they're now uh, uh, creating pornography that would attract more to a woman. Whereas men are visually stimulated, women have a tendency to be stimulated emotionally. That's how, uh, uh, that's how a guy like me can marry a smoking hot wife. I'm just, just joking, but I'm serious, I, I think she's smoking hot. But how does a dude like me marry somebody like her? Because she's not visually stimulated. <laughs> Thanks be to God. She's like, oh, I don't care how he look. And I'm like, thank you. My back all crooked. My, my chest, my sternum protrudes. She doesn't, she's like, I'm not even worried about that because I'm focused more on the emotional connection, which is good for us men. Uh, uh, but men, we tend to be visually stimulated. Um, so pornographers are creating pornography that goes more into the emotional side which, which triggers or appeals to the women so that they grow in that margin as well. Anyway, through my life, I struggled with porn. That's the bottom line. Uh, when I was 20 years old, I got baptized March 23rd, 1996. Uh, I got baptized in the ocean in St. Augustine, Florida. Um, I love Jesus, and I believe that Jesus, uh, because the Bible says that Jesus is going to take your sin and cast it to the depths of the sea, so I personally, I was like, this is great. I'm in the ocean. He's going to take my sin, cast it to the depths of the sea. Lord, I have made it convenient to you because I have walked out. I am chest deep in the ocean. All you need to do is pull it out of me and drop it a little bit further offshore. It will be good and, and go our merry way. So just as when I was 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, every year I was like, I'm going to stop this behavior same was true at my baptism. Uh, the Bible also talks about that you will be a new creature in Christ Jesus. So I was like, this is good. He's taking my sin, dropping it in the end of the ocean, plus I'm going to be a new creature in Christ. So I will never struggle with this stuff again. And I truly believe that. Uh, uh, but then just as all through my life, what happened was, and at this point too, I was already a theology major at Andrews University, so I'm studying theology, I get baptized, thinking it's gonna be great, but just as all through my life, about 10 days later, I can't remember exactly when, but days later, I'm right back at it again. To the point where I, I genuinely thought in my heart I had committed the unpardonable sin. I genuinely thought in my heart that there was no chance of victory for me or, or that God had just turned his back on me and that I would just struggle with this sin for all my life. And let me, just so that we can boogie on and, and we have 45 minutes left, but so we can get into some other stuff here, I, I will go ahead and land the plane with you guys. And I know that this is being recorded and all of that. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you that I am 40. I got baptized when I was 20. I'm not proud of this. I'm not excited about this. Uh, it has caused tremendous hell, absolute devastation in my marriage to the point where I nearly lost my marriage. And in losing my marriage, <clears throat> had I lost my marriage, that would mean complete destruction or total, not, not, not total destruction to my children, but it would have been a significant break with my children. Um, and I will, I will just, again, I'm going to level the plane and just get to the, to the heart of it because I could explain to you the ups and downs and all arounds that I've had. Uh, before I got married, I had a year of sobriety without looking at porn, and I thought I was done with it. I've been married now for 13 years, um, and I thought I was completely done. But then in my marriage, um, not blaming anybody, but this is how Satan works in my life, Thought I was done with it. A, a catalog shows up at my home. It has very provocative pictures in the catalog, and it was a trigger, and I went right back down the, the rabbit trail. Why? Because I have this neurological pathway that's been established in my brain. Can that change? Absolutely. Scripture says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. So I believe that God really wants to restore your brain. He wants to renew your brain. And I believe that that's a big part of the sanctification process. In other words, as you become a follower of Jesus Christ, 
Being a follower of Jesus Christ means you are being sanctified. Is your life going to be easy? Not necessarily. Is it going to be better? Absolutely, because you are being renewed into his image. Are you going to go through hell on earth? Absolutely. Uh, what it becomes is, is that like a crucible. Uh, what does the book of Revelation say? Jesus says, dude, you're lukewarm. Buy from me gold refined in the fire. What is gold refined in the fire? It is the most pure gold. How does it get purified? It goes through the fire. How are you purified? We go through trials. This is why scripture encourages us time and time again to rejoice when we face persecution or to glory in trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, etc. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I thought I was done with it. I get married, a magazine shows up within a short period of time after being married, and I act out with that sin again. Felt terrible. Thought I would stop, but then it, I, I, the, the behavior started uh, uh, circulating again. The addiction started engaging. And it was on again, off again. Occasionally, my wife, when we were dating, and this is a question that often comes up, um, but my wife, when we were dating, uh, so before she became my wife, I had told her, look, this is my biggest sin. Like, I, I am powerless over this stuff. I don't want to do it. I wish I didn't do it. Um, but I am literally, I mean, addiction, an addict is a person that says, I am totally powerless over a specific thing. It could be alcohol, food, sex, uh, uh, it could be money, it could be, I mean, it could be, it presents itself, the disease of addiction presents itself in a myriad of different ways. But anyway, my wife would occasionally find porn on the computer, and what would happen is, is it would ap absolutely break her, it would devastate her, because she took it extremely personally. And if we had more time, that's another important thing to go down, um, that you women, I, I, I understand on one hand that you take it personally, on another hand, the issue is far deeper. Um, um, it, it, it's, the issue is not you. The issue is sin in the man's life, or the issue is the addiction in the man's life. Or again, I've met women and, and have counseled uh, uh, or presented this you know, in groups like this, and invariably women struggle as well. So it might be the woman that, that is the sex addict. Um, but anyway, uh, as time went on, it was breaking my wife's heart. I would recover. I would get sobriety. Everything would be going great. But then next thing, it was like the stock market. It would just be up and down. I would be sober. Everything was great. And then I would something would trigger me, and I would go right back down the rabbit trail again and be back in the addiction. Then I would get caught again. At one point, I called my conference president. Uh, because my wife caught me a second time, saw it on the computer a second time, and I just called the conference president and said, look, I need help, I need to get out of the ministry, blah, 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 blah. Um, anyway, this thing has plagued me as a follower, it's plagued me for 32 years. And I can stand here to you tonight, or today, sorry, um, and tell you that God is my witness. I am walking with a level of sobriety of complete abstinence from pornography or masturbation, um, complete abstinence from what's referred to in recovery circles as your inner circle. So your inner circle is the, the most, hein your sin. Your middle circle is your, your activities that kind of lead you towards sin. Uh, um, your outer circle is the behavior that you ought to be engaging in that is life-giving. It's almost like a traffic light where you have, uh, um, you have the red, yellow, and green. Red is your inner circle, stay away. Yellow is your, uh, hey, cautionary, be careful. Uh, your green is all systems go. That is life-giving behavior. I have been completely abstinent from my, my inner circle behavior, and it has not come easily. It hasn't come without a lot of work. I've been in therapy. I've, I've, I've been reading. I'm in 12-step groups. I, I do, and we'll get into solution here in just a minute. Um, but the bottom line is, is it has not been easy, 
And the bottom line is as well, uh, not only has it not been easy personally, but it's been very hard on my wife. Um, last winter, so my sobriety date is uh, December 3 of last year, all right? So uh, December 3 of last year. Now, during that time, like when I was in Novi Sad a few years ago, uh, I presented on this uh, in Serbia, and there, there's times where I've had sobriety. I just would submit to you that I've never had the sobriety that I do today. And again, it's just come through a lot of pain, a lot of heartache. I nearly lost everything last fall. Last fall, about this time last year, into the winter, I was just in a very, very, I mean, I don't know what, how, what kind of language I can use here, but I was, in, I was in the pit of despair in my life. I was in a very terrible spot, probably the, probably the lowest I've been, where sin and addiction, not just with porn, uh, was running amok in my life. Um, and so I thank God for the trial because on the other side of the trial now, my faith, as I was saying last uh, two nights ago to a group, um, my faith in him, or sorry, it was yesterday morning at a workshop, or yesterday afternoon, uh, my faith in him has grown. Um, my faith in God has grown, and it hasn't been easy. But anyway, um, with that said, uh, and I know I'm all over the shop, um, and I can go until Jesus comes back, but let's get into uh, some scripture today. Uh, this is just a Bible verse about that deals specifically with pornography and masturbation. And I would just say, due to time's sake today, <clears throat> that if you have any questions, I'll just reiterate again, if you have any questions or comments um, uh, or points of clarification, hey, Matthew, you said this, can you elaborate on that? If we don't have time for Q&A today, please just send me an email and I will respond to you. I'll do my best to respond to you ASAP. I don't have it all figured out, but I'm willing to engage um, on this topic uh, just because I do believe it's one of the biggest plagues facing uh, our church and our society today. Um, uh, Jesus, this is Jesus. He's 30 years old. This is in Matthew 5. This is uh, the Beatitudes, or, or sorry, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, right after the Beatitudes. And he gets into this. He says, look, you've heard it said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What does this mean? A man is walking down the street. He sees a fine young thing, or, or old thing, or I don't know, just sees somebody, and is like, ooh, I want to get with her. And then his brain, instead of just saying, wow, she's beautiful, and what a beautiful creation of God, which wouldn't be lust, he actually starts lusting and imagining in his brain being sexual with this person. And what Jesus, at the age of 30, he's just coming out on the scene had just finished his 40 days in the wilderness, and he comes out and he says, oh, hey, let me uh, just cut to the chase here. Right before this verse is when he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you're not going to make it into heaven. And here he comes and says, oh, by the way, you guys, while we're at it, if you've ever looked at a woman and you lusted for her, you've actually, you think adultery is bad, but you've actually committed adultery already in the eyes of God. So in other words, for instance, if you've looked at porn and then looked at it again, uh, or like gone back, ooh, I wanna look at this porn, uh, according to God in his mind and, and the way he rolls uh, in his world, in his universe, you've committed adultery. The good news is, and this is great news for us, is that Jesus doesn't leave us hanging. He provides for us tangible solutions to our problems. So here is his solution. Verse 29, this is the very next verse. He just simply says, look, dude, if you have a porn issue, uh, if your right eye is causing you to sin, sin or to stumble, just gouge it out. Uh, just pluck it out and throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Isn't that good news? 
It's like a no-brainer. Oh, shoot, I struggle with porn. Uh, I'm just going to pluck out my eye. Why didn't I think of that? Uh, the good news is, is Jesus doesn't stop there. In the very next verse, he says this, verse 30, and if your right hand causes you to sin. Now, uh, some of you, you've, you've read this a million times, but you've never really thought of this. I just shared this recently, and somebody came out, I've never thought of that scripture that way. Could Jesus have really been talking about masturbation? Uh, look, if you're right-handed and your right hand causes you to sin, uh, just cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Isn't this super exciting? Like, I love Jesus. This is great. I want to follow him. And can't you just imagine Jesus at this moment? This is the Sermon on the Mount. So people are gathered. The wind is blowing. Jesus, white, you know, white skin, blue eyes, blonde hair, beard, just blowing in the wind, white robe. And he's like, look, excuse me. He's like, look, y'all, if you're lusting, just gouge out your eye. If you're masturbating, just cut off your hand, and we'll be done with this problem. End of story. As a matter of fact, hey, disciples, uh, stand up, and let's take up an offering. And they pass out uh, uh, the buckets. And Jesus is like, hey, we'll take up an offering right now, because if you have this problem, let's just pluck out your eye, cut off your hand. We will provide you the bucket. And guess what? Inside the bucket will be a spoon. Just, just, just wedge it back and just pop it like it's hot. Pop it like it's hot. Pop it like it's hot. And then we have a saw inside the bucket. It is called, you wonder where the hand saw comes from. Uh, this is it, the hand saw. You will take the saw and just chop off your hand and drop it in the bucket. Now you have a bunch of believers that are sitting there and they're like, you know, <laughs> like nub and this. The question is, is simply this. I think somebody needs oxygen over. Uh, the question becomes though, if you cut off your eye or cut out your eye and cut off your hand, are you going to stop lusting? And the reality is, according to Jesus, if you continue to read the Sermon on the Mount, he gets to a beautiful verse where he says, look, the reality is, is if you pluck out your eye and cut off your hand, are you going to stop sinning? No. Are you going to stop lusting? No. Why? Because your lust issue is a matter of the mind and the matter of your heart. You've got an issue in here. And you can pluck out your eyes and become blind. You can cut off your hand, but you're still going to lust. You're still going to lust. So really, it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the mind. And that's where, again, Scripture's very important. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. What is God about in your life? Renewing and restoring your mind. Um, what is he about? He does permit you to go through hell. Has my journey been easy? No. Can I stand here today as a better man, as a better father, as a, uh, a better husband, sorry, as a better father to my children? Absolutely. Was I heading when we had children? Was I heading in the exact same trajectory in the atmosphere that I grew up in where though my parents were physically present, they were emotionally disconnected from me? I was heading in that same pattern. And now I can honestly say that not only am I physically present with my children and my wife, but I'm also emotionally uh, present. What does God do? Uh, he says in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. So what happens in your journey and in my journey is, is we come to a place where does God desire that you be over lust in your life? 100%. Uh, does God really believe that if you pluck out your eye, cut off your hand, that that's the solution? Absolutely not. Uh, what he does do is allow you, I believe, in my journey anyway, he does allow many of us to go through a journey of struggle, and we come out of that journey of struggle recognizing his goodness, his grace, his righteousness. Because, and this is super important and something I've wrestled with for a long time, like, God, why wouldn't you just take this away? 
You know when I'm over here that I genuinely in my heart want to be over this thing. Uh, why wouldn't you just take it away? And what I've come to believe is simply this, that God permits you to struggle with sin so that one day you come to the place where you honestly trust him. You learn to trust him more than you trust yourself. And here's the reality. 20 years ago, when I started begging God, I used to go fasting and take retreats. I would cry to God. When somebody would make an altar call, I would go up to the altar call, pouring my heart out. Uh, when communion would be passed around, I would like take handfuls of the wafer thinking it would make me more spiritual and like multiple of the little thimble cups. <laughs> You know, trying to take more of the communion and to, whatever I could do to get over this, I was trying to do. But if God had zapped me and just said, okay, now you're good. I'm going to just take this completely away. You're never going to struggle with this again. Could it be that five years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, that I would have been like, you know what? I really don't need God. And I venture to guess that that would be the reality that pride would end up coming in, and that it would be all about self, and that is at the root of sin. Ultimately, my friend, and I don't know if any of this is really resonating, um, but ultimately, I believe that God allows you to struggle. I believe that God permits you to wrestle with this stuff. Again, I've already said it, but I'll say it again, in hopes, in the hope that you will come to the place where you actually trust Him. Ultimately, why does God give us the Bible? Why do we go to church? Why do we sing songs? Why do we pray? Why do we give 10% of our money? Does God need your money? No. All that God is desiring in your life and in my life and in the life of every human being walking the face of the planet is that you would come into relationship with Him. And unfortunately, sin breaks that relationship. So what he does is, is he gives you a Bible to reveal his character. He invites you to tithe, to test him, to learn to see if he will not pour out a blessing, to pray with him. You can't see him, but to pray with him, to sing songs. Most of you will not sing out loud anywhere in public, but then you'll come into church and start singing. Why is that? I would submit to you that in all those things, the Bible, tithe, prayer, singing, fellowship, whatever it is, mission, service, all that God is trying to do is teach you to trust Him. Um, I'm going to share with you a few statistics now uh, about the porn industry, and again, all of these are going to be on your handout. So we just did a little bit of my story, we did very little scripture, and now we're diving into a few statistics, and we'll just kind of bounce through these uh, uh, and land the plane. We may have some time for Q&A at the end. We'll see how we go. I'll believe it when I see it. Um, uh, some statistics here that are just important, and I'm thrilled to see some parents here in the room tonight. I think it's very important that parents uh, realize what kind of thing, uh, what kind of entity they're dealing with. Over $13 billion is spent on porn annually. These statistics are actually a few years old. Uh, so all of this is actually lower uh, than what the reality is. But there, um, uh, there is more money spent on pornography than in the United States, uh, in the world, than the National Football League. And I, I only have a, I, a bunch of my stats are uh, relevant or taken from the U.S. Uh, but the National Football League, the National Basketball Association, the Major League Baseball uh, uh, Association combined. Uh, so if you look at all the athletes in the United States um, and, and take all the revenue that all those sports teams bring in, all those athletes are paid, all that stuff, uh, porn is making more. Over 2 million known porn web websites are on the internet. More than 2,500 news sites are coming on every week. Um, additionally, and I don't believe I have this stat in here, uh, it may be on your handout, but additionally... Do you know that the porn industry, have you heard of companies like Google, like Microsoft, like Apple? All the revenue of those companies combined is less than the porn industry. 
And what's important to you to know, especially for those of you who maybe haven't, you're not familiar, you haven't really dabbled in porn, it hasn't impacted you personally, um, what you need to know is, is that the porn industry is so uh, 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 he, significantly big and so powerful that the majority, I have never spent one single dime on pornography. I've never spent a dime on it. Uh, and yet it has absolutely decimated my life. Again, when I was growing up, it was magazines or, or catalogs or whatever. Uh, they were pictures. Nowadays, it's all on the internet. Uh, continuing on, again, a few more stats here. Um, the pornography industry is large. Oh, there we go. I do have it on here. Sorry. Uh, larger than the revenues of the top technology companies in combined, including Microsoft, Google, Amazon, eBay, Yahoo, Apple, Netflix, and Earthlink, which I don't know what Earthlink is, but they wanted to throw it in there. Um, but anyway, are, are you understanding the magnitude of this thing? Like it is a tsunami that is running amok across the world. And with technological devices upon every human being walking the face of the earth, porn is just rampantly available. And what is it doing? In my humble opinion, what pornography does is decimate your life, help you to become a deep follower of Satan, of the evil one, uh, fills you with complete narcissism, makes you a liar, a deceiver, a manipulator. That's the fruit of pornography. Um, U.S. porn revenue exceeds the combined revenues of uh, the American broadcast something network center, uh, CBS and NBC. These are our major television networks. N notice this statistic, and this is actually from uh, this continent, the continent of Europe. Uh, nine out of 10 children aged between the ages of eight and 16 have viewed porn on the internet. In most cases, the sex sites were accessed uh, uh, unintentionally when a child, often in the process of doing homework, used a seemingly innocent sounding word or search uh, uh, for information or pictures. So what happens? For me, I'm riding dirty on my BMX bike on the construction site is when I saw porn. For a child now, they're in their home and they're just on the internet. And they do a, a seemingly innocent search and boom, porn pops up. Guess what happens when, boom, porn pops up? Again, if it's a little boy, they're visually stimulated. Boom, that image is ingrained in their mind. And, and for many, uh, many men, and some women, but many men are instantly hooked. It's like the crack addict. They smoke it once, and they're instantly hooked. 74% um, of adult commercial sites display free teaser porn images on their homepage. Uh, 25 million Americans visit cyber sex sites between 1 to 10, 10 hours per week, another 4.7 million in excess of 11 hours per week. I was going to send a, a share with you a stat about Europeans, but it was just so off the charts uh, that I, I didn't want to shame you, just joking. Um, but anyway, you just see that people are doing this. I, uh, for instance, I met a guy in seminary that we had a Hebrew exam, and he was so stressed out over the Hebrew exam, guess what he did? While his wife thought he was studying all night, he just was looking at pornography all night. Because let's be honest, what's easier or more enjoyable, studying Hebrew or looking at porn, right? So uh, uh, anyway, I know men that will actually have looked at it uh, all night long. Uh, and some daily throughout the day. 60% of all websites uh, visits are sexual in nature. Uh, every day, up to 30 million people log on to porn websites. It's everywhere. It is impacting a lot of people. And if you don't think that, that it's affecting you because you don't look at porn and you're not the one, you're sitting here today like, I, I, just, I, I didn't even know there was porn on the internet. What, it, what is the internet? If that is you... Um, I praise God for you, and I wish I was you. Uh, I wish I had never seen this stuff or never been impacted by this. But if that's you, recognize that you are the gross minority of human beings walking the face of the planet, and the vast majority have been impacted by this stuff. 
And because you are the minority, I would submit to you that you have a very, very vital role within your family makeup, especially uh, because God can use you in very significant ways to break the pattern. In my life, my dad, I know, has looked at porn, may be considered a sex addict. Uh, he and I have talked at length about this stuff. Uh, but even when I was a teenager, he handed me a porn magazine, thought it was a cool thing to do. Um, uh, porn can really decimate our families. And my prayer is, and my hope, honestly, standing here talking to you guys today, is that there would be one, if there's one person that I can at least, honestly, if there's just one human being that at least like comes out of the clouds and sees that, wow, there is actually a problem with porn, A, and B, there is a solution, and there is hope for me, uh, if there is one of you today, then that makes this, quite frankly, it would make my entire trip to Europe worthwhile. It's that significant, uh, in my opinion. And, and it does bother me, too, and this is a side note and a bit selfish of me to say, but just recently I was talking to a, um, talking to a pastor friend of mine who I really admire, and he was inviting me in for a speaking appointment and asked me specifically to commit to him that I would not say, talk about pornography. And when I walked away from the conversation, I was a bit offended and hurt because, again, I'm not up here for some show. I don't, I, I am frustrated, I have anger towards Christianity when Christianity just becomes a show or becomes a game we play or we just put on a big event. It's not about an event. This is real life. And unfortunately, in my opinion, the Christian church, but let's be specific with our context, the Adventist church, we go around talking about all this prophecy stuff, and we don't deal with the heart issue. We tell you, you have to get over smoking in order to get baptized. And maybe not all your churches do this, uh, but there are churches in the U.S. That, and pastors that will not baptize somebody if they're smoking cigarettes. And then they say, well, you got to get over smoking cigarettes in order to get baptized. So what this leads, this type of mentality leads people to believe that you have to get over sin first in order to get baptized. And then once you become a baptized Seventh-day Adventist and you're part of the remnant, then suddenly we don't deal with sin anymore. And no one talks about sin. Why are our churches spiraling and going downward? I would submit to you is because people don't really care about prophecy if their life is filled with turmoil. I would submit to you that Jesus, at the end of the day, is prophecy good? Sure. Is it powerful? Sure. Is it neat? Like neato? Sure. But at the end of the day, I don't see Jesus rolling around uh, teaching and preaching all this prophecy stuff. I would actually go so far as to say it could be that this becomes a deterrent because this makes us feel better. As long as we can talk about external stuff, then we feel better about ourselves. And yet, at the reality of it is, is Jesus wants to deal with the internal stuff. Jesus isn't concerned about your external. He's very concerned about your internal. Jesus isn't concerned about, do you come to church on Sabbath and sit there and sing a song and drop coin in a bus bucket? Uh, that's not Jesus' focus. Jesus' ultimate focus, in my humble opinion, is filling you with his spirit. And we'll get into that more uh, in just a minute uh, in our, our session, in our church gathering. So continuing on here, sorry. Uh, the average age at which a poor, uh, boy first sees porn, this is one statistic. Some statistics say the average age is eight. Others say the average age is 10. I just found this to be shocking when I came across a statistic that said the average age a boy first sees porn is five. Why is this? Because your phone, or your cell phone, every gadget that you have can access porn. PlayStation 2, the little Sony kids are playing this stuff. They can see porn. And it's believed, and this is a sobering stat, it is believed that 70% of women 
involved in pornography or survivors of incest or child sexual abuse. Why is this sobering? Simply this. The women that you view and see and believe are enjoying are actually as addicted to their painful cycle as you are, 70% of them, which means uh, three-fourths of every person involved in porn is, is estimated is in, has been involved with incest or child sexual abuse. So what are they doing? They're just manifesting their addiction and their trauma in their life. Like you're, you're manifesting yours when you keep uh, looking down this, this uh, issue. A couple more statistics and then we're done. And then into solutions. Uh, 63% of men attending man, uh, men, romance, and integrity seminars admit to struggling with porn in the past year. Two-thirds of these people are in church leadership. This comes from Focus on the Family, James Dobson, a big worldwide uh, ministry out of the Colorado Springs area, 63% of men attending a seminar are struggling with porn. That would mean 63% like of us uh, would be struggling with porn. Two-thirds of these people are in church leadership. I talk to many pastors and they're like, I just, who, who do I go talk to? What do I do? Um, one in seven calls to focus on the family's pastoral call line is about internet pornography, people that are struggling. Bottom line is, is it's a significant issue. I'm going to get into some solutions with you guys right now. Um, and, and again, all of this will be on the handout. I think we have 100 copies. I don't know how many copies are actually made. Uh, but we have a handout that will be coming to you in just a few moments as we're about to land the plane. But number one, and this, this is not my own. This comes from a guy that I know personally. His name's Joe Dallas. He's written a book called uh, The Battle Plan. And what it is is basically the notion is, is that if you struggle with porn or any addiction, whatever, if you are an addict that struggles with an addiction, in other words, I don't want to do this, and you do it anyway. That would make you an addict. If you're wondering, well, I don't know, am I an addict or not? If you say to yourself, I want to stop eating this much, or eating sugar, or whatever, drinking coffee, or I want to stop whatever it is, looking at porn, and you keep doing it, that's an addiction. Um, and what Joe says is, is, look, you've got to treat any addiction as though you are uh, fighting a battle. And if this is the enemy... <laughs> Your best likelihood for success in defeating the enemy is if you attack it at multiple angles. In other words, it is rare that there's like one little, one solution. And have I met men or I've traveled around, I've literally presented on this stuff on multiple continents. Have I met a few men who I've, I, I, and I'm not trying to boast on this, but I'm jealous, quite frankly, but I'll present on this, something will go off in their mind and in their heart, and they're done with porn for the rest of their life. I've met several that this has happened, uh, which I'm like, man, I wish that was my, my experience. But most of us, it's going to be a journey. It's going to be a struggle, and we have to learn to battle it from multiple angles. What does Joe Dallas say? He says, you've got to define what sobriety is for you. So in this case, what, what your addiction to porn or to lust or to sex, the way it manifests itself, there is a whole spectrum of addictions or manifestation of this addiction. Uh, uh, and I could go into a lot of detail on that because uh, I've been around a lot of human beings that str struggle in one way or another, and pornography seems to be like the, the elementary level, and then it just can manifest itself on up from there. Uh, but he says it's important to define sobriety so you know that this is the standard that I'm after. Daily armor, if you're not reading any scripture, start reading scripture. What scripture should you read? Maybe start looking at, at scripture about purity or, or righteousness. Uh, if you're not praying at all, start praying five minutes a day. Um, verbally recommit. And this goes back to the plasticity of let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Verbally recommit to yourself, God, I recommit myself to sexual purity for the next 24 hours. Pla the plasticity of your brain. Your brain is an amazing organ that can actually heal itself. 
when you combine or, or, or it can heal. Let me say that. <clears throat> because you want it to be healed by God and through his spirit. This is why meditation is so important. Uh, Dr. Tim Jennings, he's a Seventh-day Adventist that recently presented, uh, wrote a book published by InterVarsity Press called The God-Shaped Brain, and in it he submits that 15 minutes of meditation on a benevolent God, on a God of love, every day changes the makeup of your brain. It will actually change your life. Studying Scripture can actually, meditating on Scripture will actually change your brain. If you verbally start committing and saying, God, I recommit to you for the next 24 hours to stay sexually uh, sober, what will happen is, is your brain will start to believe it. Your brain actually believes thoughts and often believes your thoughts are reality. Exercise of management techniques, that's what I'm going over right now. These are various management techniques. Uh, motivational review journal, what is that? Why are you motivated to stop, to make this practical to everyone here? If sex addiction or porn addiction is not your issue or compulsive masturbation is not your issue, what is your issue? And, and if you have a particular issue, why are you motivated to stop? I'm motivated because I wanna be a better, a better man. I wanna be a man of integrity. I wanna be a better husband to my wife, a husband that my wife deserves. I wanna be a better father to my children. Motivational Review Journal is, what are you, why are you motivated to stop? Um, he goes on, that was daily armor. Weekly armor is meeting with an accountability partner once a week. You establish a, a day and a time. If any of you go to a 12-step, say your deal is alcohol, and you go to Alcoholics Anonymous, and by the way, there are 12-step organizations for this. If you go to a 12-step, that would be accountability or a form of accountability. Here he's saying actually find a person where you become brother, iron sharpening iron, or if you're a sister, a, a, a daughter of Christ, you find another woman where you're accountable. I've seen this happen on multiple occasions where a woman chooses her best friend guy that is going to be their accountability partner and it does not go well. Uh, so please, I beg of you, women stay accountable with women, men stay accountable with men. You establish a day and a time. You create a personalized list of questions you'll be asked. This way, there's no beating around the bush. A group meeting would be AA, or maybe you start an accountability group in your church. We have one at ours. Uh, number three would be going to see a therapist. Um, I actually see, when I get back on Monday, I'm going to a men's, a, a small group with a therapist half a day Wednesday and all day Thursday. Um, I, I freely would confess to you, and my church knows, I, am, I go see a therapist uh, who speaks into my life. I believe God uses them in incredible ways. If you have a pastor you admire and respect, you may want to talk to the pastor. Recreation can also be important, though none of these are a, a sure-fit answer. Uh, again, you're going to get these, and these are kind of repetitive uh, to what we just went over. So uh, if you have any porn, destroy it for sure. I just want to share with you a few of these, and then all of this is going to be on your handout. Uh, these are some helpful websites, triplexchurch.com. If you haven't been there before, I would highly recommend it, um, though it can be triggering. So be careful, but there are some great resources. There's accountability software that's available for free on there. Um, I, actually, a guy that I've worked with quite cl closely is on their board. Um, so, I, and I really love much of what they do. Their ministry, these guys actually go in and minister to porn stars. Like they actually minister to porn stars I will have to tell you that would not be my ministry. Like they go to porn expos, for instance, in Vegas and set up a booth and give away Bibles that say Jesus loves porn stars. That would not be my, my calling, right? Uh, all right, continuing on. Uh, but I, I think it's super important. Net Nanny, accountability software, prodigals online, accountability or software and there's tools there setting setting captives free if you're looking to do something and you're like super ashamed and you don't want to talk to anybody about this i have heard great success 
uh, from settingcaptivesfree.com. It's a free uh, uh, service that walks you through uh, recovery. Here are a couple books, and then I'm done. Uh, Out of the Shadows by Dr. Carnes. Dr. Carnes is the leading, in my opinion, the lead. He's actually the guy, the founder of, of coining the phrase sex addiction. Highly recommend uh, anything that he writes. Dr. Carnes, I met him uh, last year and just an amazing, amazing guy. Bernie Anderson is the brother that's on Triple X Church board. Uh, he's an Adventist pastor in Orlando. Uh, he's written a book from a pastor's perspective called Breaking the Silence, where he shares his story uh, uh, with this struggle. You can find that more than likely at your ABC, or they can order it for you. An Affair of the Mind by Lori Hall. Powerful book. If you're a woman uh, and your man is struggling with this stuff, that's what her story was, and it's a powerful, powerful book. Just keep in mind that her husband that she is depicting was a sex addict on another, like he was way, 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 addiction manifests itself in different ways. This dude was way off the deep end, uh, not that any of us are any better or worse or whatever, but, well, he was pretty screwed up, but we're all screwed up. But anyway, uh, a hunger, sorry, accidentally just tripped the button. Uh, a, hunger, a Hunger for Healing by Keith Miller, again, a great guy. This is a general 12-step book. Uh, I highly recommend it, Keith Miller. Uh, the Game Plan by Joe Dallas, that's what I just referenced a moment ago. Ted Roberts used to be a pastor, now he's doing this ministry full-time, Pure Desire. He and his wife, I've met them, learned, with, learned from them, uh, great people, great book. He does talk about hell a lot in the book, uh, but there's really good stuff. He's an ex-Marine, military guy, pilot, real hardcore, man's man type of guy. And uh, just, I, I have a lot of respect for him and his ministry. Um, so we're at 1112. I'm going to, um, I'm going to just say a word of prayer to, to wrap up and then maybe we can conclude with a video and then just have a moment or two for Q&A and then we'll go from there. Cool? All right, let's pray. Hey God, I want to thank you again for this opportunity. I thank you for this audience and those that were here. I have no clue, God, what's going on behind the scenes in their lives, uh, but you do. And so I'm just grateful that uh, this event has chosen to at least address this topic. And I know it's not easy. I know it's not comfortable, uh, but I'm grateful. And so I would just pray yet again that, that, that there would be at least one person here today that would be touched for all of eternity because of the goodness that you pour out, uh, because your presence has been here. Um, so I just pray again that you, as you, Jesus, are lifted up as the victor uh, on this planet, as the one that defeated death and sin once and for all, uh, that you, Jesus, would leverage our time here spent uh, to further your kingdom in each of our lives, but especially for at least one here, uh, that that person would be delivered that the whole trajectory of their lives, of their, uh, of their families, of their children, of their children's children uh, would be impacted, that somehow, some way, uh, there would be a force for good, that porn would not snuff out all the followers of you, but somehow, God, we would rise above, that we would be more than conquerors, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.